Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome, hello. Uh, welcome to our second politics forum event of the semester. Uh, for those of you who are new to the College of New Jersey or to politics forum programming, uh, the politics forum is sponsored by the Department of Political Science. It's a forum for the presentation of analytical and or empirical research concerning political power, institutions, and choices. We welcome presentations by faculty from across the social sciences and the humanities whose research bears on these matters. <clears throat> Today's event is being co-sponsored by the Department of African American Studies, and we'd like to thank them for their support with this event. Uh, today's speaker is Domingo Morel. Uh, Professor Morel earned his PhD at Brown University in 2014. Today, he is an assistant professor of political science and an affiliate member of Global Urban Studies and the Center on Law, Inequality, and Metropolitan Equity at Rutgers University in Newark. He does research on racial and ethnic politics, urban politics, education politics, and public policy. In particular, he is interested in the ways that state policies help expand or diminish political inequality among historically marginalized populations. His talk today bears the title of his first book, Takeover, Race, Education, and American Democracy. And we are very happy to welcome him here today. Domingo, I'll hand things over to you. Hey, well, thanks so much for the introduction, Nick. Uh, thanks Dan, uh, to Dan and everyone else at the College of New Jersey, um, including uh, my, my former uh, Brown uh, grad student colleague, uh, Cadence, who um, I'm, I'm, I know she's somewhere in, in uh, listening and watching. Um, so I'm going to cover a lot of ground. Um, this is, I think, the best way to demonstrate how I arrive at the major conclusions from this work. So, you know, I know that you all are going to have an opportunity to ask questions uh, towards the end. So I'll be happy to answer any questions if there's something that, you know, I go through and, 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 and it's not clear in whatever way, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Uh, so this, this project began in, uh, in 2009, it was my first year as a graduate student at Brown. Um, and on two separate occasions, uh, President Obama and uh, then Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, uh, gave remarks on two separate speeches, um, uh, kind of applauding the efforts of administrators in Central Falls, Rhode Island, uh, smallest city in, in Rhode Island, um, for firing all of the teachers at a low performing high school. In, in, in the city. And, you know, obviously that made news, but I was really, you know, kind of interested in why is it that the President of the United States and the Secretary of Education are making remarks about the, small, the smallest city in the smallest state in the country. And as somebody who was, you know, studying political science was really trying to understand who are, who are the decision makers here? Who, you know, what do the politics look like in Central Falls? And so, and, you know, at the time that I'm looking at what's happening in, in the Central Falls, uh, the city and the district, uh, Central Falls is looking like a lot of other cities um, in the process of gaining political empowerment. So that is in Central Falls is majority uh, Latinx community and they're transitioning from having very little political power to having political power. And it all began at the school board level. So here we have Anaconda Morales, who's a chair of the school board and so um, they first have representation on the school board and from the school board to the city council and then to the mayor's office. So at the time that I'm doing this research, Central Falls was on the verge of electing its first Latino mayor. And so the scholarship is pretty kind of consistent with you know, this kind of trajectory that as communities who go from having very little political power to gaining power, it usually begins at the school board level transitions to the city council and then to the mayor's uh, office, right? And so Central Falls looks like a lot of cities in this regard. But what was uh, interesting, puzzling about Central Falls is that the first Latinos to be uh, served on the school board in the city um, were uh, arrived at the school board after the state took over the local schools in the 1990s. And so uh, at the time, uh, Latinos represented a significant portion of the population, but didn't have any representation on the school board. It was an all white school board. And when the state took over the schools in the 1990s, it abolished the locally elected school board, appointed a new school board. And that new school board had Latino representation for the first time 
in the city's history, right? And so this was uh, really interesting. <clears throat> and so state takeovers, there was you know very little research done at the time looking at um, state takeovers, the politics of takeovers across districts and you know across time. And so I began began uh, getting interested in, in what are potentially political implications of this. So. Uh, takeover is when the state legislature, the state board of education, another entity like federal courts, charges the state department of education or another des designated entity such as a mayor with managing a school district. So in most school districts across the country, the schools are governed by a local entity like a local school board. And so a state takeover is obviously when the state comes in and takes that power away from, from local entities. The first state takeover of a school district was in 1989, the Jersey City Schools in New Jersey. And since then, there have been about 100 state takeovers. So this was about, as of 2015, there are a couple more now, but there are you know, about 100 state takeovers of local school districts across the country. Now, for anyone who's listening, you might be uh, asking, well, you know, 100 uh, school districts is not, you know, there's not that many school districts. We have about 13,000 school districts in this country. Right, so what you know? How is 100 school takeovers uh, of school districts significant, uh, significant? Well, you know that you know I think that that's it can be accurate until we start to look at what the map of takeovers look like. And here we have, um, you know, some of the the selected cities right that have experienced takeovers. Right? And then, and as a scholar of race politics, urban politics, you know, these cities really pop out at you, right? And so they're, of course, major American cities, um, but they're also, in many cases, majority Black cities. And if we look at the history of these cities, um, it also becomes quite clear, you know, the history, how um, it, it has been contested racial spaces, right? Um, and, and so for these reasons, now the 100 school districts are not that insignificant. And then when you look at the, the, the states that have cities that have experienced takeovers, you have essentially majority of the black student population in these cities, in these states, I should say, who are attending school districts that are either under state control or were at some point under state control. So again, uh, these, although it's only been about 100 state takeovers uh, of local school districts, uh, it, it's not an insignificant number when you look at the cities that are experiencing this. And so, you know, the research that had been done up to this point, essentially, for the most part, not all, but for the most part, looking at state takeovers and asking questions, when a state takes over, uh, a state takes over a school district, what are the implications for our traditional educational outcomes, right? So does it improve math and reading scores? Does it improve graduation rates? Does it improve, you know, attendance, right? And so these, these, these are the kind of questions that people are generally interested in, which kind of makes sense. But the argument here is that we need to pay attention to not only those outcomes, but the political outcomes as well, right? And so you know, the public schools have been at the front line of the struggle for political empowerment for communities, right? Um, public schools have provided the venue for citizens to engage in the public sphere when other avenues of political participation were not available. And the school board in particular has been, uh, has served as the entry point for Black and Latino political office holders. So in other words, the rise of Black and Latino politicians in many cities usually begins at the school board level, as I just mentioned, um, in, in the example of Central Falls. So for these reasons, it makes sense to try to think about what are the political and understand what are the political implications of state takeovers, right? So I begin with a series of questions. You know, as the state centralizes governance, which is what's happening here, right? The state is centralizing governance over a traditionally a local matter. What are the political implications for local communities? What effect do state takeovers of local school districts have on Black and Latino political empowerment? And specifically, how do state takeovers of local school districts affect Black and Latino descriptive representation on local school boards? And so the argument here is, um, you know, uh, based on the existing research, one would uh, kind of predict that a state takeover is going to lead to disempowerment of communities, or of local communities. And what I argue is that this decentralization as optimal argument 
ignores the complicated history that racial minorities have had with government, right? So throughout history, we see how black communities, for instance, kind of rely on outside intervention against state and local authorities, which are um, uh, preventing them from gaining political power, preventing them from, you know, buying homes and things like that, right? So if we automatically assume that the state coming in at a, to a, to a uh, uh, local community and taking over its schools, that if it automatically is going to lead to disempowerment, well, that ignores this complicated history. And so what I'm essentially trying to argue here is that the extent to which centralization is harmful or helpful is a function of how politically uh, 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 empowered a community is at the time of centralization. So if you have political power as a community and the state comes in and takes over your school district, then that will lead to a disempowerment uh, situation. However, if you have very little political empowerment at the time of the takeover, it might actually open doors that didn't exist for you to be able to gain political empowerment. So that's the argument, right? And so I collect data and try to test uh, try to test these hypotheses and create an original data set of state takeovers uh, between 1989 and 2013. Rely on a number of sources here. I'll be happy to, you know, I'm going to go kind of quickly through this, but I'll be happy to answer any questions about data sources um, and, and, you know, models and, and, and on any other questions you may have related to this. Uh, the, the dependent variables that I'm um, uh, interested in examining here are Black and Latino descriptive representation on the school board, and that is measured as percentage of school board membership, right? I run panel data regression in 94 districts in this actual um, in, um, uh, analysis and uh, 844 observations over time. My independent variables, main independent variable here is state takeover, a dichotomous vari variable measured zero. So for no takeover, one for period um, uh, of takeover. And then I have a number of empowerment variables, including black mayor, Latino mayor, black seats on the city council, again, measured by percentage. Same thing for Latino seats on city council and a number of other control variables, Republican governor, city population, black percentage of the population, Latino percent of the population, and so forth. Right? And so what the descriptive data here show is that in pre-takeover observations, Black communities have higher levels of political empowerment than Latino communities in, in pre-takeover observation. That is, we find that in the, in the period before takeovers that Blacks have, uh, Black communities have greater membership of, of city council members and mayors as compared to Latinos. Latinos have very little political empowerment at, again, measured by Latino mayors and Latino members on the city council and these pre uh, takeover observations. And so based on the hypothesis, you would expect that African-American communities are affected differently than Latino communities. And that's um, essentially what, what we find that black descriptive representation appears negatively affected by state takeovers in this period of study. Black descriptive representation on the school board decreases about four percentage points, but cities that have higher levels of Latino, of black political empowerment are affected even more. And it's associated with about a 10% decrease in black school board membership following a state takeover. On the other hand, Latino descriptive representation appears to benefit from the state takeovers between this period of time. In other words, when a state takes over a school district, what we see is that Latino descriptive representation on the school board increases in these uh, post takeover um, observations. So in addition to collecting these data, I'm also doing a case study analysis of Newark, New Jersey. And Newark makes sense for several reasons. Uh, so New Jersey, again, is the first state to take over a school district. New uh, Newark is uh, very much representative of what other districts that experience takeovers look like. And so what we find in Newark is kind of consistent with what the data uh, analysis tells us, right? So here is Newark School Board descriptive representation between 1990 and 2006. The blue represents a black representation, the orange is Latino representation, and the gray here is white representation. The school district was taken over in 1995. And what we see here is 
um, there's a slight decrease after the takeover in black representation on the school board, but it's really insignificant, right? The real significance here is the growth in the Latino uh, representation following the takeover. And so uh, Latinos represented in 1995, and you know, pretty much throughout the last 30 years has been roughly about the same, uh, about 35% of the population in Newark and had very little representation at the time of the takeover. Once the takeover happens, the state removed the locally elected school board, appointed a new school board, and in that new school board had greater Latino representation. And that's why we see the increase there in, in Latino representation on the school board. What we also notice is, um, and this is based on analysis of school board meeting minutes throughout this period of time, it's not just that you get more Latinos on the school board, but they are also discussing issues that weren't discussed in a prior to their representation on the school board. So issues of English language learners, for instance, right at the time was ESL, uh, issues about uh, Latino vendors, for instance, uh, coming to the school district to be able to you know, develop their businesses, right? Uh, we also see greater conversations about Latino leadership, whether at the principal level or other levels within the school district. So the content starts to change in, in, uh, in, uh, as a result of uh, that, that is content at the school board meeting level as a result of this increased representation of, of Latinos. Now, African Americans, although they don't see a sharp decrease in representation, they do have a really substantive loss of political power. At the time of, before the takeover, they represented the majority they were able to control issues of hiring, firing, who the superintendent was going to be, curricular issues, and the state takeover stripped that community of that power, right? And so there was, there was a real loss there for the African-American community. And by 2002, the state still controls the school district. However, it switches from an appointed board to an elected board. And we see here that by and after the 2002 election, Latinos come to represent the majority of the school board in Newark, although they only represent about 35% of the population in Newark. And so what's happening here is that the Latino community, you know, I argue, felt that although the state took over the school district, that they were, there was an opportunity there to participate in the political process in ways that were not accessible to them before. And so in 2002, we see the largest number of Latinos that run for the school board in the state, in the city's history. And on the other hand, African-Americans feel like it's almost not, um, uh, it doesn't make any sense to participate in this process because we're being, um, we're, the, the power that we had to run the schools has been stripped from us. And it doesn't make any sense for us to participate in this. So it's affecting communities very differently here, right? And so at the same time that I'm doing this, there's there's some questions that start to emerge, right? Uh, additional questions. Um, so as I'm collecting data and as I'm uh, attending school board meetings in Newark and talking to people in Newark, there's a series of other questions that emerges, that emerge. And one of those questions is involved the type of school board following a takeover. So when a state takes over a school district, there's usually three, three approaches. One is that the state can leave the locally elected school board in place, right? Another approach is that the state abolishes the locally elected school board and appoints a new school board, the same way we saw happen in Newark and the same way we saw happen in Central Falls, right? And then the third possibility is that the state uh, abolishes the school board and doesn't replace it at all. So no school board at all. And so when we look across the board, about what this looks like across communities, across states, it's, it's, um, it's revealing, right? So although um, the majority of districts that experience takeovers are black districts, they are majority white districts that experience takeovers and majority Latino districts that experience takeovers as well. However, when uh, the state takes over a majority white school district, majority white school districts get to keep their elected board about 70% of the time, right? Um, majority Latino districts that experience a takeover, they get to they get to keep their elected school board about half of the time. Uh, so 55% of cases they're abolished and uh, a, a, a new board is appointed. But if we look at majority Black school districts, they only get to keep their elected school board about 20% of the time, and so roughly 80% of the time they lose their school board. Half of those 
the a new school board is appointed and then about another half of 33% or so is not uh, 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 replaced at all, right? And so this is, we see it mostly in, in Southern communities, um, in Southern states where this happens. So this is, you know, kind of points to, to other questions that worth examining. In addition to that, as I said, I was doing casework in Newark and I'm attending school board meetings. So here's a picture of an image of a school board meeting. Uh, this is between 2012, 2013 school year. Uh, on average that year, there were about 300 people that attended, attended the school board meetings in Newark. Uh, you know, if anybody's watching this and you've gone to school board meetings, uh, you probably have, you know, what, 15, 20 people that go to a school board meeting in your town. Uh, so 300 people is a lot, right? And I'm talking to uh, elders, people who've been involved in local politics and school politics there for a long time. And you see young people mobilizing as well. So that year there was significant mobilization, walkouts and so forth. And the one thing that starts to kind of emerge for me is that, you know, as I came to Newark to, to do this research, I had read all of the kind of work that had been done on the Newark public schools and the takeover. So it was a 1700 page report written by the state. The, um, the Star Ledger had dedicated significant attention to the, the takeover of the Newark schools. The New York Times wrote many pieces on this. And the overall kind of uh, consensus was that the takeover was justified because the community had failed to provide an education to its children, right? So that the, the community in some ways had failed to provide an ad adequate education to their children through their local politicians and so forth. But, but my experience in, you know, talking to people and observing what's happening in Newark is something very different. And what I noticed was that here was a community that was very much interested and invested in the education of their children. And that maybe it wasn't that they didn't care as the you know, argument went, but that by caring and by engaging in political struggles associated with this, it may have led to a certain type of political response that may um, uh, have may be associated with the you know, reason for the takeover, right? And so, um, in order to kind of test this, uh, the, this this thesis. Like I first want to begin with the history of Newark and its takeover to then be able to you know take this information and you know and and and, and test it beyond Newark, and so this this leads to certain research uh, uh, new research questions, right? Why take over in the first place? Right? So the the research up to this point was focused on trying to understand the implications of of a takeover, but you know I think. That, that question about why takeover wasn't really examined. Why do state takeovers dispro disproportionately affect black communities? Right? We look across the board, it's not just black communities that have underperforming schools, right? We have many, many Duke school districts across the country who are underperforming. And additionally, why do black communities disproportionately experience the most punitive forms of a state takeover, right? <clears throat> And in addition to this, again, as I'm collecting these data, there's something else that uh, I think is revealing. And that is the party of a governor when states pass takeover laws. So in order for a state to take over a school district, it first has to pass a law. And so when we look at the, the, the governors in power at the time that these laws are being passed, they're overwhelmingly Republican, right? So it's about 80% of cases uh, where it's led by Republicans. And so um, why would Republican state officials take the lead in proposing state takeover laws and initiating state takeovers of local school districts when the ideological and conservative principles would suggest an approach that favors local control rather than state centralization, right? Because this is what we have come to understand at least about uh, you know, Republicans and conservatives favoring local control. This seems to be uh, contradicting that in some ways, right? And so again, uh, first, want to look at the history of Newark and its experience with takeovers to then see if there's any patterns that emerge that we can try to test uh, beyond Newark. And the first thing is, you know, we have to go back to the 1960s, right? So in the, by the mid 1960s, uh, African Americans represent the majority of the population in Newark, but have very little political power. 
little political power at the school board level, no political power at the city council level or the mayor's office, right? And in 1967, there was a school board seat that was opened. And at the time, the school board uh, uh, members were appointed by the mayor. And the African-American community expected and actually demanded that the mayor, a white mayor, um, appoint an African-American to the school board. But the mayor did not do that. He appointed uh, an ally, um, uh, uh, a federal, uh, a city council member from Newark. And that led to, you know, um, essentially an eruption of anger among African-Americans in the city of Newark. And at the school board meeting, um, one of the school board meetings, the head of the NAACP said that if they don't appoint an African-American to the school board, there will be blood in the streets on uh, the streets of Newark. And of course, just a, a couple of weeks after that, 1967 here, there was an eruption uh, in, in the city of Newark, uh, one of the deadliest urban uprisings, some call it riots, right? a riot uh, in Newark, they call it a rebellion, happened, right? And there were 20, 20, 22 people that were, that were killed in this, in this uprising, right? Um, the, the commissioner, I'm, I'm sorry, the governor of the state commissioned a study to try to look at what were the underlying factors that led to this um, uh, rebellion in 1967. It of course was ignited by the uh, beating of, of an unarmed uh, black taxi uh, uh, cab driver uh, by white police officers, right? That's what's the event that led to this. But there, the, as a commission shows, a report shows there were a lot of underlying factors. And the report attributed the controversial school board appointment as one of the factors that helped set the stage for the July riot. So in addition to referencing lack of representation on the school board as a key factor, the report also cited the state of educational crisis in the Newark public schools. The dropout rate was at 32%. There were uh, dilapidated buildings and shortage of teaching personnel. And by the mid 1960s, the Newark public schools literally did not have this physical space to educate every Newark student. Right? So the, the conditions were dismal for uh, the Newark public schools. And the report recommended that the state take over the Newark schools to provide an opportunity for African-Americans to have a say over their public schools. So guess who was for this and guess who was against it? The African-American community in 1967, or you know, by the time this report comes out in 1968, and the Latino community who have essentially no political power are not against the takeover. They view the takeover as a possibility, as an opportunity to be able to gain political empowerment. On the other hand, the white power structure led you know, by um, um, folks in the North Ward in Newark, they were completely opposed to this idea. And in fact, called this uh, a governor's dictatorship, right? The, pot, the, the idea that the state would come over and take over their local schools, that that was anti-democratic, that that was a dictatorship, right? So in 1968, the, the, the state does not take over the Newark public schools. But by the early 1970s, the black community in Newark does start to gain political empowerment, significant political empowerment. So they have more members on the school board, uh, majorities on the city council, and they elect their first um, uh, black mayor um, as well. And in addition to gaining political power at the city level, they're also pushing for resources for the schools that are in bad shape, right? And so uh, the black community in Newark, in addition to other co uh, communities across the state of New Jersey are filing lawsuits to get more resources for their schools and they're actually winning, right? So here we have New Jersey state funding of public education between 1969 and 1996. This is in billions of dollars we see this sharp increase in dollars uh, across the board for public education in the state of New Jersey. And this is a direct result of these lawsuits. First in 1974 with the Robinson v. Uh, Cahill case, and then again in 1985, what we, begin, what we uh, know as the Abbott cases, right? So several Abbott cases that lead to increased school funding for, for these communities. So they are winning. They're gaining political power and they're demanding more resources for their schools and are securing these resources. At the same time that this is happening, it leads to this type of collision between urban communities in New Jersey and non-urban communities. 
right? So here we have the Newark superintendent, Eugene Campbell, at the time, this is the 1980s, and he's saying 28 districts would be receiving a significant increase in funds. The children of New Jersey stand to benefit by this change in funding to school districts in need, right? So this is what the superintendent of the Newark Public Schools is saying. At the same time, uh, John Dorsey, the Republican Senate mi minority leader from Morris, one of the wealthier districts in New Jersey, stated that the new funding formula required working class people in middle class communities who drive around in Fords to buy Mercedes for people in the poorest cities because they don't have cars. And so we get this tension, right, between the urban districts that are poised to get these new resources for their schools for the first time in the state's history, and then the communities who see, who are uh, resentful that, you know, according to them, their resources is being essentially robbed from them, stripped from them to then be sent to these school districts. So I want to pause here and, and um, go beyond Newark for, for a minute. So this is, this is kind of the, the, the context for what happens in Newark. And so I think it's important now to try to understand at the same time that this is happening in New Jersey and in Newark and other urban districts in the state of New Jersey, what is happening across the country? Because I think that's important for us. That type of context is, is important for us to understand what's happening across the board. Excuse me. <clears throat> so in the 1960s, what we get is, again, I, I think this is important for us to understand, um, again, the context here. Um, so we went through the Newark case, and now it's important to understand what's happening beyond Newark during this period of time. So by the late 1960s, a federal urban access or an alliance between the national government and, the, and cities began to emerge, right? So Johnson administration, of course, is uh, President uh, Lyndon Johnson. His administration promotes a pro-civil rights agenda and federal aid that went directly to cities um, bypassing states altogether increases significantly, right? So part of the what's happening here in the late 1960s, 1967 and 1968, you get these urban uprisings. And part of the argument here is that this federal government needs to provide more resources to these communities, right? And at the same time that they're providing these resources, African-Americans are gaining more and more representation at this local level and they begin to get gain political empowerment. So you get this federal urban access emerging. Again, the national level is adopting a more pro-civil rights agenda. And at the local level, you're getting um, uh, these majority African-American cities and they're gaining political empowerment, right? So this is what's happening between the national and, and, and local level. And we see how increases in dollars um, from the national government directly to the cities increase. So here we have a federal aid to cities between 1960 to 1976. What we're seeing here is a percentage of cities uh, general uh, revenue. And these are just some selected cities, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, Houston, and so forth. And what we see is we see an increase from 1960 throughout the early 1970s partly as a result of commitments that we see in 1967 and 1968 from Lyndon Johnson and from Congress, again, to try to deal with these concerns that we see in cities, right? <clears throat> so we're having uh, a national government that is promoting a civil rights agenda. At the local level, we see the increase in Black political empowerment, and we see these resources increase for cities at the same time. So what is the response by conservatives right, and Republicans? Well, you know, uh, here we have Nixon and, and, and Reagan. What they, what they do is they're trying to break what's happening at this, uh, this, this federal urban access and see that their path to political power, the conservatives, Republicans, that is, is at the state level. And we see the emergence of what's called new federalism, right? Starts with Nixon, but really takes off with, with Reagan. And that is, um, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. That is trying to uh, devolve power from the national government to the state level, right? So it's taking away powers from the national and bringing it down to the states. And what we see happen is, you know, especially during the, the, the Reagan years, that money that was sent from the national government to cities starts to decrease significantly. They see that these dollars that were going to these communities are highly problematic politically for them because they're going to essentially the, 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 the opposition party, right? And so the conservative response here is to the federal urban access was to strengthen state governments. Although the new 
uh, the era of new federalism, which has been typically considered an era of devolution, also ushered in an era of, of centralization, where states would gain greater say over local governance. Moreover, by the 1970s, this conservative movement at the state level was also uh, led to and was aided by the emergence of influential policy organizations that are very much powerful today, like the Heritage Foundation, which was created in 1973, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and the Cato Institute. These uh, conservative policy organizations at the state level began to create kind of like this climate for strengthening state governments. And again, you know, they're very much uh, um, you know, part of our, our political reality um, a contemporary political reality. And so there's this collision between cities and state governments, and perhaps more so than any other policy domain, control over public education became a central point of contention between state and urban localities. School politics was a source of political mobilization for Black communities. School politics paved the path to Black political empowerment in cities. As Black communities in, uh, increasingly mobilized, they also demanded greater resources for their local school systems that had been negligent to Black students. And while funding for cities decreased, as I showed you, school funding is one of the few policy areas where funding actually increased during this period of time. And so here we have total public education expenditures uh, in billions between 1977 to 1992. We see that you know uh, funding is uh, relatively stable until the early to mid 1980s, where we start to see sharp increases. Very much like New Jersey, we start to see these sharp increases in dollars. Now, this um, is not really in, uh, a result of the national government uh, spending money. This is mostly state governments spending money, right? And so one can ask, well, maybe perhaps what's happening here is that we get greater uh, number of students that are attending schools, and it's really not, right? So the orange line here, again, the blue line here still represents the public expenditures, and the orange line here represents um, the, the number of, 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 of uh, students enrolled in, in millions, right? And so that, re that remains relatively stable across the board, about 40 million students. So it's not that we get this surge in the number of students, it's that states are now required to spend more dollars, not because they want to, but because communities are demanding that they spend more dollars, right? <clears throat> and if we look at the percent of state's fiscal year budget in 1987, we see that nearly 23% of all uh, state funding is dedicated to elementary and secondary education, right? So this is what's happening. Across the board, we see decreases in funding, but education is one of the areas that it's increasing. And increasingly, these dollars are going to communities that are being led by African Americans. Right? <clears throat> so by the 1980s, we get what it's known as, you know, the emergence of education governors, right? They assume greater authority over local schools. And at the 1986 annual meeting of the National Governors Association, the governors announced a plan that would be part of a second wave of reform in American public education and introduced the policy of state takeovers of districts that failed to meet toughened minimum standards. This is the first time that we see language in the Governor's Association talking about state takeovers. And it's happening precisely at the time when these communities are gaining the resources that they need to improve their schools. And so from this perspective, then we can see, and the majority of these governors are Republicans again, we see why there's, uh, there's this push for takeover laws by Republican governors. Additionally, um, here's another um, kind of a data point here. This is school funding uh, plaintiff victories between 1980 and 2000, what I call the incubation period for takeover laws. So between this period of time, 1980 to 2000, there were um, 18 states where plaintiffs won court victories to secure more resources for their schools. And we see that in 14 out of those 18 um, states, states passed takeover laws following those victories, right? And the only states where that didn't happen was Montana, North Dakota, Vermont, and Wyoming, four of the whitest states in the country, right? And so here is some further evidence that um, takeover um, the, the the funding issue is associated with, with takeovers. 
So, you know, what I argue here is that the conservative response was to promote a logic which professed an interest in improving education for Black students at the same time that invested in the political disempowerment of the Black community because of the tension that exists there, right? And so I want to test this, these hypotheses. Now, is, is uh, school funding uh, at the state level associated with increased likelihood of a takeover? And is Black political empowerment associated with the like, increase in the likelihood of taking over a school district? So I create, again, a, an original data set of uh, the universe as takeover. This is between 1991 and 2006. I rely on a number of data sources. In this particular analysis, my dependent variable is takeover. So whether a state takes over a school district or not. And I run a logistic regression here, and there's 988 districts across in, in this analysis. So I, I, the, the way that I arrive at these districts, I'm looking at districts that are in states that have experienced a takeover. I'm looking at, at, at a minimum of 3,000 um, uh, population, student population per district. It doesn't include charter schools or non-traditional schools. It's all public schools. And so this is the data that I'm looking at. Uh, my independent variables here are the empowerment variables, again, whether a city has a Black mayor or not, or Latino mayor, uh, Black seats on the city council, again, me me um, measured by percentage, and a number of control variables, including city population, city percent of the population that is Black, Latino and white, and school district population. And um, as part of this analysis here, of course, I want to know whether uh, revenue at the local level, state or federal level, have any bearing on uh, the likelihood of a takeover. And then finally, I include here a measure for um, a poverty measure for district percent that received free lunch. And so this is not just a poverty measure, it's probably the best pro uh, proxy that we have for educational outcomes. So unfortunately, we don't have, and particularly going back to this period of time, we don't have any education outcomes that we can measure across districts, across states, across times, right? So across time. And so the best that I have available uh, in this, this data set is district percent of, of free lunch. And so the results of this analysis show that the two strongest predictors of a takeover is state revenue, right? So the amount of money that the state gives a local community, right? Which is kind of what we would anticipate here. But the strongest predictor is the percentage of black city council members uh, that a city has. So if you have zero black city council members, then you have about 3% of a predicted probability of your district being take, taken over. By the time you have a steady city council that is essentially fully African-American, that increases to about 15% of predicted probability. So here's the strongest um, uh, predictor of a takeover, um, black city council membership and state revenues, or you know, the money's coming from, from the state government to, um, uh, uh, to, to your local school district, right? And so what are implications of this, right? So states began to take over school districts precisely at a moment when school districts were beginning to get the resources that communities demanded. The emergence of state takeovers in the 1980s and 1990s represents a shift from the idea of the undeserving Black student, an idea systematically challenged in the 1950s and 1960s, to a focus on the undeserving stewards of the education of the Black children, right? So the, 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 the community organizations, the locally elected officials, and so forth. The political collision between state governments and urban communities that create the conditions of a takeover are incapable of producing the collaborative environment that is necessary for sustainable school improvements. And finally, the systemic political disempowerment of Black communities through the state takeover of a local school district show that how education is central to the project of state sanctioned political inequality. So I think this is something that doesn't deserve, that doesn't get enough attention. I think that people are, are automatically assume that everybody uh, has the best interest for these children in these communities. And what I'm trying to argue here that it's a lot more complicated and that politics plays an important part in this. And that's, that's uh, worthy of investigation and examination, right? So in terms of policy discussions, now I have to say, you know, I, I wrote this book before the Trump administration. So um, 
the results following that there's some things that i you know led me to question whether this is really what uh, we should be thinking about but still worthy of discussion so i think um you know asserting greater levels of local control is an important and necessary uh part of uh democratizing the process of education but in addition local democracy and you know uh, i'm sorry because i'm I have to move this here. I can't see the whole, uh, sorry. So in addition, local democracy can be promoted by increasing the role of the federal government in public schools. Local control can be bolstered by a more robust federal presence in public education in three key areas, I argue. Funding, so right now, you know, the federal government is, uh, makes up about 10% of local school budgets. So I argue that it can be increased. Uh, establishing stronger links between the federal government and cities, kind of similar to kind of what we saw happen in prior eras. And then finally, and this is a, um, a part of the, I think, research that I think we need to be paying more attention to. You know, the courts argued that the federal government, uh, there's nothing in the federal government that said that funding, equal funding is, is, is constitutional, right? It's something that is protected under the 14th Amendment. And because of that, the, the, the Supreme Court has stayed away from requiring certain levels of funding for communities, right? But here I argue that, you know, providing equal rights protections to communities of color that are polit politically marginalized by the actions of state governments is something that the courts can take on. That is, because education is not just education, it's a political right. That because governing your schools as a community is a political right, then the courts need to be stepping in to provide these protections for communities when state comes in and takes over their local schools and no longer have a say. Right? So I think that there's a role for the federal courts to play at, a, and particularly the Supreme Court here, um, in, in, in providing the type of supports that communities need to be able to govern and run your schools. So with that, you know, take any questions. <clears throat>